Good evening, and welcome to the Cathedral St. Thomas More and to the service this evening in honor of uh, saints and African Americans on the pathway to sainthood. We welcome everyone this evening uh, to the service, and uh, after the service, we invite everyone to go downstairs for some refreshments and to socialize downstairs. At this time, I would like everyone to invite everyone to stand so that we may begin. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Peace be with you. And with your spirit. It's a great joy to be with all of you this evening, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, for our prayer service, and certainly welcome all those who are joining us via the live stream. Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, who by glorifying the holy men and women of every time and place, bestow on us proofs of your love graciously grant that, commended by their intercession and spurred on by their example of the holy way of life, we may be faithful in imitating your only begotten Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the first letter of St. John. Beloved, we love God because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, but hates his brother, he is a liar. For whoever does not love a brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. This is the commandment we have from him. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is begotten by God. And everyone who loves the Father loves also the one begotten by him. In this way, we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. For the love of God is this, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For whoever is begotten by God conquers the world, and the victory that conquers the world is our faith, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
people, the sheep of his flock. We are his people, the sheep of his flock. We are his people, the sheep of
be with you. And with your A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a scholar of the law, tested him by asking, Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and the first commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The whole law and the prophets depend on these two commandments. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. A great gift to me in our diocese has been the council assisting me in implementing the bishop's document, Open Wide Your Heart, as we continue to seek effective means of addressing the evil of racism. And it really was from the members of this committee that this idea came forth, that we would have a night like tonight, a prayer service, to highlight the diversity of the communion of saints to lift up those men and women who are an example for all of us. And I'm so grateful to the members of the council for your ongoing work, collaboration, and consultation. It has been a very exciting week in the Diocese of Arlington, uh, beginning just last Saturday with our diocesan pilgrimage to the Basilica Shrine of the Immaculate Conception. I still have chills walking out and seeing that basilica filled with people from our diocese for the celebration of mass of all ages, of all backgrounds and cultures, reflecting our unity as the body of Christ, as members of God's holy family. And then on Monday with the Universal Church, we celebrated all saints. Those men and women who are that inspiration, that example for us, in whose footsteps we must walk. And then the next day, being in a cemetery, celebrating Mass on all souls being reminded that one day we will all die. And so we must continue this earthly pilgrimage with our eyes always fixed above. Because the destination we all long for, we all hope for, is life with God forever in heaven. And we sure have to help each other get there. And that brings us to this evening, during Black Catholic History Month, celebrating the diversity of the communion of saints. Like all of you, I'm looking forward after this reflection of hearing the, the stories, more about the life and the example of the saints whose memory we recall this evening and the soon-to-be saints, the servants of God, and the venerable. They are our powerful intercessors. They help to show us the way to heaven and teach us how to become a saint. Thank you all who will be sharing their stories with us this evening. As many of you know, we have implemented within our diocese a five-year strategic plan. 
and members of the Council on Racism have made sure that within that strategic plan there are some essential goals. And I would just like to highlight two of them for you this evening. And one is that we promote vocations to the priesthood and consecrated life in all the communities and cultures within our diocese. We have to do a better job at that. And tonight helps. I'm thinking of some young black Catholics who may be discerning God's will, maybe even to become a priest or consecrated religious. And I'm praying real hard tonight that as they hear the stories of the saints in this booklet, that maybe that's exactly what they need. And that's how God will speak to them to say yes to his call, to realize it is possible to give your whole life in service to the Lord and his church with courage and in all faithfulness. The second goal that our council wanted to make sure was within our strategic plan was celebrate ethnic richness with more engagement across all communities. And that's what tonight is all about. The saints we honor tonight are not just for those who are here or those on live stream or black Catholics in our diet. It's for all of us. And that's why I think tonight is so beautiful. We're celebrating the unity, the universality of the one holy and Catholic and apostolic church. So what we have done this past week and what we do tonight reminds us of some essential truths. Right now, we are on an earthly pilgrimage and journey. We walk in the footsteps of the saints, and one day we will die. And on that day, we will be held accountable to the mandate we heard proclaimed in tonight's readings regarding love of God and love of neighbor. In one of the high schools in which I taught, the principal made sure that there was no student handbook. Remember the student handbooks with all the rules and regulations you had to follow? He said, not in this school. We don't need it. Here's what our students need to know. Love God and love one another. And if there was behavior found not acceptable by one of the students, they would be asked to address the question. How was what you just did love of God? How was what you just did love for brothers and sisters? And you know what I discovered? That asking them that question was much more effective than giving them detention. Because that is what is deep within inside all of us. And that is what the saints we honor tonight show us. They are considered among the blessed, as Jesus taught, because they were peacemakers. They were meek. They were humble. They were pure of heart. They suffered for their faith, but did not abandon it. They mourned, but they did not lose hope. They loved God 
with all their heart and soul and strength and mind. And they love their neighbor as themselves. And if we do the same, then the fruits will be a very vibrant, faith-filled, service-oriented, united diocese, as well as parishes, schools, and communities without any form of racism, bias, or discrimination. Through the intercession of Mary, our mother, and St. Joseph, the saints, and the soon-to-be saints we remember this evening. May that be the reality here in this diocese at this exciting time in our history and always. Amen.
at this time, Joseph Brooks Sr. from St. Joseph Parish in Alexandria, Virginia, will do a presentation on St. Peter Claver and also the Knights of Peter Claver and the ladies at Zillary. St. Peter Claver was born in Verdes, Catalonia, Spain in 1580 of impoverished parents descended from ancient and distinguished families. He studied at the Jesuit College of Barcelona, entered the Jesuit novitiate at Tarragona in 1602 and, looked, and took his final vows on August 8, 1604. While studying philosophy at Mallorca, a young religious was influenced by St. Alfonso Rodriguez to go to the Indies and save millions of perishing souls. In 1610, he landed at Cartagena, modern Colombia, the principal slave market of the New World, where a thousand slaves were landed every month. After his ordination in 1616, he dedicated himself by special vow to the service of the Negro slaves, a work that was last for 33 years. He labored unceasingly for the salvation of the African-American slaves and the abolition of the Negro slave trade and the love he lavished on them was something that transcended the natural order. Boarding the slave ship as they entered the harbor, he would hurry to the revolting inferno of the hold and offer whatever poor refreshments he could afford. He would care for the sick and dying and instruct the slaves through Negro catechists before administering the sacraments. <clears throat> Through his efforts, 300,000 souls entered the church. Furthermore, he did not lose sight of his converts when they left the ships, but followed them to the plantations to which they were sent, encouraged them to live as Christians, and prevailed on their masters to treat them humanely. He died in 1654 and was canonized a saint in 1888 by Pope Pius IX, the Knights of Peter Claver. On Sunday, November 7, 1909, in the city of Mobile, Alabama, took place the initiation of the first band of 40 colored men, the nucleus of a fraternal society which will be known as the Knights of Peter Claver. The order was founded by four priests of the St. Joseph Society of the Sacred Heart, the Josephite Fathers of Baltimore, Maryland. Fathers Conrad F. Ripisher, John H. Dorsey, Samuel J. Kelly, and Joseph P. Van Bast, SSJs and three laymen of the Diocese of Mobile, Messrs. Gilbert Faustina, Frank Collins, and Frank Trinier. The missionaries to the colored people have been very hampered by the fact that most all the men belong to one or other of the fraternal organizations which they would not or could not leave. They simply joined them for social and beneficial purposes. Time and again, they have told the missionaries that they would gladly leave them if there was anything else to take their place. These other fraternal organizations were not Catholic and fearful they might lose these men to other faiths, moved them to form a fraternal society for colored people 
which has grown into the largest predominantly African-American Catholic lay organization in the world. Next, St. Martin de Porres will be uh, introduced to you by Eden Ingram for St. Timothy's Parish in Chantilly, Virginia. St. Martin de Porres, whose feast day was this past Wednesday, provides us a perfect example of someone who does good no matter what happens to him. His mother was an African or Indian from Panama and a former slave. His father was a Spanish soldier and nobleman. So people made fun of Martin because he came from two different races. What did Martin do? He blessed his enemies. He did good to those who laughed at him. Was this easy? No, but Martin simply loved to do good. Martin was born in Lima, Peru in 1579. His father left his family when Martin was only eight years old. This left Martin and his baby sister and their mother very poor, but Martin still gave away whatever he could to other hungry and poor people. When he was 12, Martin went to work for a barber. He learned to cut hair and to heal wounds. Later, Martin wanted to join the Dominicans in their work. He was allowed to work with them as a servant who swept floors and answered the door. At the time, the law in Peru did not allow persons of other races or mixed race to enter religious life. Finally, his years of good work and miraculous cures led the Dominicans to allow him to become a lay brother, but even some of his fellow Dominicans still scorned him. He eventually founded orphanages for homeless children and cared for lonely African slaves who had been forced to come to Lima. He gave shirts to those who had no clothes, bread to those who had no food, and shelter to those who had no homes. St. Rose of Lima was one of St. Martin's closest friends. One day, he found on the street a poor Indian bleeding to death from a dagger wound and took him to his own room until he could transport him to his sister's hospice. The prior, when he heard of this, reprimanded him for disobedience. He was extremely edified, however, by his reply, forgive my error and please instruct me, for I did not know that the precept of obedience took precedence over that of charity. The prior gave him liberty thereafter to follow his inspirations in the exercise of mercy. St. Martin was a friend of both St. Juan Macias, a fellow Dominican lay brother, and St. Rose of Lima, a lay Dominican. By the time he died on November 3rd, 1639, he had won the affection and respect of many of his fellow Dominicans, as well as a host of people outside the priory. Word of his miracles had made him known as a saint throughout the region. As his body was displayed to allow the people of the city to pay their respects, each person snipped a tiny piece of his habit to keep as a relic. It is said that three habits were taken from the body. His body was then interred in the grounds of the monastery. After St. Martin de Porres died, the miracles and graces received when he was invoked multiplied in such profusion that his body was exhumed after 25 years and said to be found intact and exhaling a fine fragrance. Letters to Rome pleaded for his beatification. The decree affirming the heroism of his virtues was issued in 1763 by Pope Clement XIII. Pope Gregory XVI beatified Martin de Porres on October 29, 1837, and nearly 125 years later, Pope John XXIII canonized him in Rome on May 6, 1962. St. Martin de Porres is the patron saint of persons of mixed race and of those who suffer from discrimination in addition to innkeepers, barbers, and public health workers.
St. Catherine Drexel will be presented by Rebecca McCullers from the Basilica of St. Mary's in Alexandria, Virginia. St. Catherine Drexel is the second American-born saint to be canonized by the Catholic Church. This amazing woman was an heiress to a large bequest who became a religious sister and a brilliant educator. St. Catherine is the patron saint of racial justice and philanthropy. Her feast day is celebrated on March the 3rd. Mother Catherine Drexel was the founder and superior general of the Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. She devoted her life and resources to the support of black and Indian missions in the South and West. Through a generous contribution from Mother Catherine, the construction of a new church, St. Joseph Church in Alexandria, Virginia, became a reality in 1915. In 1925, she also founded what became Xavier University of Louisiana. She established over 100 schools that served Native American reservation and Southern African American inner city and rural communities. The sisters never wavered in their mission, even when they were threatened by bodily harm and their buildings were vandalized. St. John Paul II canonized Catherine Drexel in 2000. In his homily during the canonization mass, he said, quote, She taught a spirituality based on prayerful union with the Eucharistic Lord and zealous service of the poor and the victims of racial discrimination. Her apostolate helped to bring about a growing awareness of the need to combat all forms of racism through education and social services. Catherine Drexel is an excellent example of that practical charity and generous solidarity with the less fortunate, which has long been the distinguishing mark of American Catholics." End quote. The St. Catherine Drexel Society at the Basilica of St. Mary in Alexandria, Virginia was founded in June of 2020. The Society prays for the healing of our nation especially for the healing of historical wounds inflicted by slavery that continue to affect our populace today. We gather every Wednesday evening and pray the rosary and other prayers during Holy Hour in reparation for sins past and present against the dignity of the human person, especially racism, and for the unity of human society under the peaceful Lordship of Jesus Christ. Catholic teaching encourages reparations, not only for our own sins, but through the virtue of the communion of the saints and the oneness of the mystical body of Christ to also make reparation for the sins of others. Through our prayers, we ask God to repair the spiritual damage that has been done and to heal our community, our state, our country, and the world. St. Catherine's love for the Eucharist, her spirit of prayer, and her Eucharistic perspective on the unity of all peoples are key inspirations for our Holy Hour. May the prayers of the saints, O Lord, we pray, obtain help for your faithful people, that they may gain a share in your eternal inheritance with those whom they celebrate with devotion, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.
Venerable Pierre Toussaint will be introduced by John Williams from Christ the Redeemer in Sterling, Virginia. <coughs> Pierre Toussaint was born in Haiti around 1766 and born uh, to New York City as a slave where he worked as, uh, and di until he died. Monsieur Berard, the plantation owner, allowed Pierre's grandmother to teach her grandson how to read and write. In his early 20s, Pierre accompanied his younger sister, aunt, and two others to uh, the city where he uh, worked as a hairdresser and eventually in the homes of rich women. When his master died, Pierre supported his master's widow and the other slaves himself. He was freed shortly before the widow's death in 1807. Four years later, he married Marie Rose Juliet, whose freedom he had purchased. They later adapted Euphemia. His orphan niece both preceded him in death. During his lifetime, Toussaint enjoyed a reputation of an exceptionally devout and charitable person. Every day he attended the 6 a.m. Mass in St. Peter's Church, where he was a pew holder for many years. He also raised funds to build the original St. Patrick's Cathedral and St. Vincent de Paul Church in New York. Pierre donated to various charities, generously assisting blacks and whites in need. He and his wife opened their home to orphans and educated them. The couple went into neighborhoods devastated by fever and plague, where, he, where everyone else was too frightened to go, and nurse abandoned people who were suffering from yellow fever. Perhaps his favorite charity was the Roman Catholic St. Peter's Orphan Asylum, started by his friend, Mother Elizabeth Ann Seaton, that he often visited. Urged to retire and enjoy the wealth he had accumulated, Pierre responded, I have enough for myself. But if I stop working, I will not have enough for the others. Cardinal Terence Cook introduced Pierre's cause for canonization at the uh, Vatican in 1968. In December 1989, the late Cardinal O'Connor had the remains of Pierre Tisson transferred from Lower Manhattan to St. Patrick's Cathedral in Midtown, where he was buried as the only layperson alongside the former Cardinal Archbishops of New York City. On December 17, 1997, Pope John Paul II declared Pierre Toussaint venerable, thus placing him firmly on the road to becoming North America's first black saint. Venerable Mother Enretta Lyle will be presented by Tom Castillo from St. John Newman's Parish in Ruston, Virginia. Henriette de Leo was born a free person of color in 1812 in New Orleans a dynamic, growing city and a major international port. By the early 1840s, its population totaled 350,000, and fully half, 175,000, were slaves and free persons of color. Henriette's mother was part of a sophisticated European-style upper-class society that included free persons of color based on the services they provided. She personally educated Henriette, including in such topics as French literature, music, and dancing, appropriate to her mother's upper social class, which presumably would become Harriet's as well. Henriette, raised a Catholic, 
found through her faith and love of God a far more compelling vocation than her mother's. In 1827, at 14, Henriette was asked to teach in a Catholic school established for young women of color, slaves, and the poor. In 1835, Henriette's mother had a breakdown from which she did not recover. Henriette took over managing her mother's estate. Once she was sure her mother was well cared for, she sold the balance of the estate. In this period, Henriette experienced a profound religious conversion. She proclaimed, I believe in God, I hope in God, I love. I want to live and die for God. She fully committed herself to, to aiding slaves, the poor, and elderly of New Orleans. In 1842, Henriette founded the Sisters of the Holy Family with a commitment to nursing the sick, caring for the poor, and instructing the ignorant. Mother Henriette was assisted in this work by lifelong friends and other young women drawn to work in the service of others. Finances were a constant challenge. In 1847, Mother Henriette started the Association of the Holy Family, comprised of lay people of color, the association provided financial support for the work of the sisters, making possible in 1849, for example, a home for the poor and elderly named the Hospice of the Holy Family. This is just one of Mother Henriette's many initiatives in the years that followed. Henriette died in 1862, but her legacy lives on in the Sisters of the Holy Family and the many institutions that remain in New Orleans providing services for those in great need. In, eight, in 1988, the Superior General of the Sisters of the Holy Name requested the Archbishop of New Orleans to petition Rome to begin the process of canonization of Mother Henriette de Lille. She was called Servant of God, the first step in the canonization process. Intense research on Mother Henriette led to her positio, 6,000 pages of materials delivered to the Vatican. After several years of review, in 2010, Pope Benedict XVI declared Mother Henriette venerable. Currently, two reported miracles are being assessed. As the final line on her obituary stated, Henriette, for the love of Jesus Christ, made her the humble, devout servant of slaves. Next, we'll have Father, uh, Venerable Father Augustus Tilton, presented by Nate Tyner of the St. Joseph Seminary, Washington, D.C. Augustus Tolton was born to enslaved parents, Peter Paul Tolton and his wife, Martha Jane Chisholm, on April 1st, 1854, in Rawls County, Missouri. With the outbreak of the Civil War seven years later, Peter hoped to gain freedom for his family and escaped to the North, where he served in the Union Army. He was one of the 180,000 African Americans killed in that war. His widow, Martha, decided she would see her husband's quest for freedom realized in his children. After a harrowing crossing of the Mississippi River, they entered Illinois and settled in the small town of Quincy. When her children attempted to attend Catholic school there, local white parents were not happy. To avoid a messy situation, the school sisters of Notre Dame decided to tutor the Tolton children privately. 
As Augustus grew older, he began displaying an interest in the priesthood. His parish priests, Father McGurr and Richard, encouraged the young man in his aspiration and tried, without success, to enroll him in several diocesan seminaries, all of which refused him entry on the grounds of his being black. If the seminaries would not have him, the two determined priests would begin Augustus's education in theology themselves. And so they did. Finally, in 1878, the Franciscan College in Quincy accepted him, and two years later, he was enrolled at the College of the Propaganda Fidei in Rome. After completing his courses there, Augustus Tolton was ordained on April 24, 1886, becoming the first openly black priest in U.S. history. His first assignment was at St. Joseph's Church in his hometown of Quincy, where he served for two years and gained enormous respect from many of the German and Irish parishioners there. He was later given a parish on the south side of the city, St. Augustine's Church, which would later become St. Monica's in Chicago. This would be Father Tolton's parish for the rest of his life, and it also became the center from which he ministered to all the black Catholics of Chicago. He also addressed the first Catholic Colored Congress in Washington, D.C., organized by Daniel Rudd in 1889. On February 24, 2011, Chicago's Cardinal Francis George officially began the formal introduction of the cause for Tolton's sainthood by which he received the title Servant of God. Joining Chicago in that cause are the dioceses of Springfield, in which Tolton's hometown is located, and Jefferson City, where Tolton's family was enslaved. On June 12, 2019, Pope Francis authorized the promulgation of a decree of heroic virtue, advancing Tolton's cause further. Thus, he was granted the title Venerable, which he retains to the present day. The last stage before canonization, should a miracle be approved, is beatification. Let us pray. Grant, we pray, Almighty God, that the example of these holy men and women, who we remember today, may spur us on to a better life, so that we who celebrate their memory may also imitate their good deeds and holy way of life. Through Christ our Lord. Servant of God, Mother Mary Lane, will be presented by Beverly Thornton of St. Joseph Parish in Alexandria, Virginia. Servant of God, Mother Mary Lane. She was born Elizabeth Lane around 1794 in San Diego de Cuba, where she lived primarily in a French-speaking community. She received an excellent education. Early in the 1800s, Elizabeth came to Baltimore as a courageous, loving, and deeply spiritual woman. There was no free public school education for African-American children in Maryland until 1858. So she responded to that need by opening a school in her home in the Fales Point area of Baltimore for the city children. Providence intervened through Reverend James Hector Jaber, SS, 
who had encouraged James Whitfield, Archbishop of Baltimore, and presented Elizabeth Lang with the idea to establish a religious congregation for the education of African American girls. Father Traver would provide direction, solicit financial assistance, and encourage other women of color to become members of this first congregation of African American religious in the history of the Catholic Church. Elizabeth joyfully accepted Father Jober's idea. On July the 2nd, 1829, Elizabeth and three other women professed their vows and became the Oblate Sisters of Providence. Elizabeth, the foundress, and first superior general for the Oblate Sisters of Providence took the religious name of Mary. William Cardinal Keeler, Archbishop of Baltimore, opened a formal investigation into Mary Lang's life and works of charity in 1991. The Vatican's Congregation for the Doctrines of the Causes of Saints approved the cause in her sainthood in 2004. And Archbishop William Laurie of Baltimore created a chronological celebration to transfer the blessings of Mother Lang's remains. The faithful venerated the relics before they were sealed in a reliquary and the sacrifices in the chapel oratory in the mother house in Baltimore. The sacrifices cannot be reopened without Vatican's permission. Also pre presented at the celebration and present was Bishop John H. Ricard, Bishop Emeritus of Pensacola, Tallahassee, and Xavier brother, Reginald Cruz, for Mother Lang's cause of sainthood. In the congregation for the cause of sainthood approved the position being written by Brother Cruz. Mother Lang's currently considered servant of God. Now she'll be given a title of venerable. Next, a confirmation of a miracle attributed to her intercession would be necessary for the beatification and a second miracle will be necessary for the canonization to sainthood. We need to pray for Mother Mary Lang. Thank you. Servant of God, Sister Julia Greeley, will be presented by Beverly Carroll, Carroll of Holy Family Parish, Dale City, Virginia. Denver's Angel of Charity was born into slavery in Hannibal, Missouri between 1833 and 1848. As a young child, Julia's right eye was destroyed by a cruel slave master's whip. Freed by the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863, Julia earned her keep by serving white families in Missouri, Colorado, Wyoming, and New Mexico, though mostly in the Denver area. Whatever she could spare, Julia spent assisting poor families in her neighborhood. When the resources were inadequate, she begged for food, fuel, and clothing. To avoid embarrassing the people she helped, Julia did most of her charitable work under the cover of night through dark alleys pulling a little red wagon. Julia entered the Catholic Church at Sacred Heart Parish in Denver in 1880. The Jesuits who ran the parish considered her the most enthusiastic promoter of devotion to the sacred heart of Jesus they had ever seen. Every month she visited on foot every fire station in Denver 
and delivered the Messenger of the Sacred Heart and other Catholic literature of the Sacred Heart lead to the firemen, Catholics, and non-Catholics alike. There was no one in the area that did not know old Julia. No other Denverite had equaled her record in distributing her leaflets. Just like clockwork, she got at least 50 subscriptions and sold almost 200 almanacs every year. She did all of this while not being able to read, write, or count. After her conversion, Julia Greeley attended the old cathedral on Stout Street and is remembered by pioneer Catholics as a familiar figure. She was also identified with the Sacred Heart Parish ever since her, its establishment in 1879, and no other layman has worked harder from that day for the upbuilding of the church. She was a daily communicant practically ever since her conversion. Her priest stated she was charitable to an astonishing degree in her devotion to the Sacred Heart, the Blessed Virgin and the Blessed Sacrament was marvelous. She never ate any breakfast, except when she was going to do heavy work and it was necessary to have substance. This fasting was a religious act and was not caused by her poverty because her friends would have gladly given her a meal. She was asked many times by Father McDonald whether she had eaten breakfast and replied, my communion, is my breakfast. She joined the Blessed Secular Franciscan Order in 1901 and was active in it till her death at age 85 in 1918. To the present day, many people had been asking that her cause be considered for canonization, a request which was finally granted in the fall of 2016. As part of the cause for canonization, Julia's mortal remains were transferred to Denver's Cathedral Basilica of the Immaculate Conception on June the 7th, 2017. Servant of God, Sister Thea Bowman, will be presented by Kali Iroko. The granddaughter of slaves, Sister Thea Bowman was the only African member, African American member of the Franciscan Sisters of Perpetual Adoration, and she transcended racism to leave a lasting mark on U.S. Catholic life in the late 20th century. Sister Thea Bowman was a self-proclaimed old folks child. Bowman was the only child born to middle-aged parents, Dr. Theon Bowman, a physician, and Mary Esther Bowman, a teacher. At birth, she was given the name Bertha Elizabeth Bowman, she was born in 1937 and reared in Canton, Mississippi. As a child, she converted to Catholicism through the inspiration of Julia Franciscan Sisters of Perpetual Adoration and the missionary servants of the Most Holy Trinity who were her teachers and pastors at Holy Child Jesus Church and School in Canton. Sister Bowman died of cancer on March 30th, 1990, at age 52. Many people consider her a religious sister, undeniably close to God, and who lovingly invited others to encounter the presence of God in their lives. She is acclaimed as a holy woman in the hearts of those who knew and loved her and continue to seek her intercession for guidance and healing. Servant of God, Sister Thea Bowman, left an indelible mark on her community and on her church. She lovingly taught young people about the joy of being Christian. She challenged her church 
to accept her fully as black and fully Catholic. She embraced her suffering with a willing spirit and she called all to a living faith. At their annual fall plenary assembly in Baltimore, Maryland, the U.S. bishops participated in a consultation on the cause for sainthood of the servant of God, Sister Thea Bowman. Bishop Robert P. Dealey, chairman of the Committee on Canonical Affairs and Church Governance, and Bishop Joseph R. Copaz, Bishop of Jackson, Mississippi, the petitioner of the cause, facilitated the discussion. By a voice vote, the bishops indicated unanimous support for the advancement of the cause on the diocesan level. Let us pray. O God, by whose gift your servants persevered in imitating Christ, grant us through their example and prayers that faithfully walking in our own vocation, we may reach the perfection you have set before us in your Son, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. At the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. At this time, I would like to thank Bishop Burbage and the entire diocesan staff for allowing us and inviting us to share the stories of each of the saints that we presented tonight, as well as the six holy people on the pathway to sainthood uh, within the United States. Uh, I would also like to thank all of the presenters uh, that worked hard to put this together and uh, provide their presentations tonight. And of course, Eugene and the choir that sang so beautifully tonight, we would like to thank them as well. I would like to also remind you or to tell you that the next event that we will have is an event in January in celebration of Dr. Martin Luther King's uh, feast day. Um, also, later in the year of 2022, we will have another uh, activity for Black History Month in November, either the first or second Saturday of November. Details will follow later. We also would like to invite you for refreshments downstairs after uh, the bishop's final remarks. Uh, there's plenty of food. Please, please eat plenty, plenty, plenty. Mm -hmm. And thank you. I join in offering uh, my thanks to all who helped to uh, plan this prayer service today, a beautiful uh, celebration. And I think, dear friends, as we heard these powerful stories, we see that in every age where there is darkness and evil and sin and rejection of the gospel, God raises up holy men and women to be a source of inspiration for all. And our age is no different. More than ever, our church and our nation need holy men and women, faithful to the Lord and to the gospel. Pray God with his grace that we leave here tonight with a renewed commitment to live saintly lives, to be those holy men and women, so that we too will be counted among the blessed and one day pray god live in the communion of all the saints in the kingdom of heaven the lord be with you and with, with your spirit. spirit may almighty god bless you the father the son and the holy spirit Amen. go in peace glorifying the lord by your life thanks, thanks be to god. God.